On this, the July 31st, 2023 edition of What the Ship, we're going to look at the top five maritime stories. Hi, I'm your host, Sal McCogliano. Welcome to this week's edition. So we're going to look at those top five stories with a big update on a whole batch of stories that are out there, plus one story from a viewer request. If you're new to the channel, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. All right, let's jump into this week's stories. Story number one, quick updates on five stories that we have been covering on this channel quite extensively, but really a quick little one minute update here. So first off, Fremantle Highway still adrift off the coast of the Netherlands. The ship had broke its tow, but a crew went back on board, reattached the tow, and the vessel is once again under tow. The fire has diminished considerably. We're seeing much less fire, but the fire has ripped through a good portion of the vessel. Right now, the salvage teams are trying to find a good spot to tow this vessel to so that they can put it into some secure waters, board the vessel, do fire suppression, and determine whether or not what the salvage process will be. This is an ongoing process. It's going to take time. No one wants to board this vessel until they know that it is stable. Second story, Canadian dock workers renew strike threat with the rejection of contracts. So this has been on again, off again, on again, off again type strike. This is the ILWU, the International Longshore Warehouse Union on the west coast of Canada in British Columbia. They have basically, they went on strike, they came back to work, went back on strike, went back to work, and now they are in the process of continuing this contract renegotiation, and they have just rejected the most recent contract. However, work is still going on. Obviously, a lot of issues to cover here. Third, Russia continues to threaten civilian vessels in the Black Sea, according to Ukraine. There is an audio out about a ship being challenged by a Russian corvette that's patrolling between the Turkish Straits and the Danube River Anchorage. There is a big fear that Russia may interfere on the passage of these vessels. I'm not saying attack, but interfere, basically determine whether or not ships are carrying cargo. There was an allegation recently that Russia stopped a vessel from crossing under the Kerch Strait Bridge because of explosive residue in the vessel. So Russia is being much more confrontational with their surface warships and vessels heading up to not just their ports, but also to Ukrainian ports. And let's remember, Ukraine is unloading cargo through its ports on the Danube River. We saw attacks on the Ukrainian grain structure, on their infrastructure, including a hit on a Romanian vessel that was off the port. Romania is just on the south side of the Danube River. Fourth, the Suez Rajan is still stuck off the coast of Texas. The U.S. is having a hard time finding a lightering operation to get the oil off the vessel. No one wants to do this because they don't want to be attached to this and fear that their vessels may get targeted by the Iranians over in the Persian Gulf. There is a question about whether or not they can bring this ship into the loop. This is the Louisiana offshore oil platform and offload the vessel that's being looked at but right now suez rajan still remains in that anchorage off the coast of houston texas not being offloaded and then finally the last good piece of news which i will say is that the oil transfer from the uh, decaying uh, fuel storage uh, offshore unit the safer off the coast of yemen is ongoing smith salvage is on board the vessel that they're transferring to is alongside and they have begun the process of getting the oil off this platform that has been decaying for nearly a decade now this will prevent a huge environmental disaster should this vessel break up or begin to leak uh, it's been a long process a long ongoing process it's not done yet still a lot more to be done but it's really good news that this has been going on so a lot of updates there. Be sure to subscribe and follow to get updates on this. I'll be doing a feature that'll be coming out here this week on car carrier fires over the past few years. We'll be talking about why car carrier fires are having it. And I got videos on each of those five uh, stories right there that you can go back and take a look at with some more detail. All right, let's go ahead and jump into story number two. Story number two, let's look across some sectors here and get some updates on what is going on. So I tagged three stories here that all talk about the same thing. 
but have different views of them. And I thought it was very amusing because depending on who you read and where you get your news from on the maritime sector, will slant or kind of cast where your viewpoint is on a subject. So this story about CMA CGM profit. So this is over from Tradewinds. CMA CGM profit plummets as it expects sluggish second half of 2023. Okay, I'm reading that and man, it's it's the end of the world. It's, it's one of the biggest container liners who's about to eclipse Maersk as the second largest container container liner in the world is seeing its profits plummet. That, that does not sound good. It sounds like things are bad for the container sector. This story over at G-Captain, CMA, CGM braced for weaker profit before demand pickup in 2024. Reuters story talking about the same thing, talking about the fact that the company is seeing this downturn. If you look at the story, the company privately controlled by the Saad family, yes, it's completely owned by one family, reported a second quarter net profit of 1.3 billion down from 7.6 billion in the year earlier period and from 2 billion in the first quarter. It expects the first quarter to have been its most profitable this year. So profits are down, but then you head on over to Freightways, Greg Miller's story. Container shipping giant CMA CGM still earning a billion a quarter. French Group's revenue per FEU, this is 40 foot equivalent unit, those 40 foot containers, up 36 to 37 percent versus pre COVID levels. So, depending on how you look at what's going on with CMA CGM, it's either the 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 worst of times or it's the best of times. We're, 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 we are we are you know a tale of two cities here. We've gone full Dickens on container shipping here. And it just matters your perspective. They're making over a billion dollars a quarter CMA, CGM. Now it's nowhere near the record profits they were making prior to, you know, uh, uh, record profits during the supply chain crisis. But if you look at the decade beforehand, holy crap, was it terrible. I mean, it was terrible. There were years they were losing money. There were years they were barely making profits, but now they're making a billion dollars a quarter. So the question is why, Sal? So, okay, wait a minute. First off, why Why do different perspectives? Well, you got to look at who is putting the stories out there, who's reading those stories. Tradewinds is very much a, uh, a, a journal that is read by the industry, and so they tend to want to really focus on, you know, a perspective from the industry. Freight waves, uh, it is more for the consumer of the of the shipping, so they want to be able to talk about that. And then that story you saw over GCAM, I would argue, is, the, is kind of the balance between the two. It's a Reuters story looking at it. But it's, again, this is one of the reasons why you have to have context in undering it. CMA CGM is making a huge amount of profits, nowhere near what they did but still making profits. And the reason for that is this story over at Splash 24-7, Sam Chambers, the box rates on the Trans-Pacific soar amid strict capacity discipline. We have been talking about the fact that freight rates had completely bottomed out after the supply chain crisis. We were talking about down to pre-COVID levels in terms of freight rates going across. But right here, Drury's last spot rate on the Shanghai to Long, uh, Los Angeles route soared by 6% yesterday to $2,087 per FEU, 40-foot equivalent, a fourth consecutive week of gains. The rates to the U.S. West Coast are now 42% ahead of that same time in 2019. And again, it's nowhere near what we saw during the height of supply chain when we're talking about $10,000 on the Drury index with some spot rates going up to double that. But what we just saw happen was freight rates bottomed out. I mean, bottomed out. We were talking about less than almost $1,000 to get across the Trans-Pacific. But now they're up. And if you look at the East Coast rates, East Coast are also on an upward swing now at 3049 per FEU, according to Drury. That makes them 12% ahead of this same time in 2019. Why is that happening? Well, again, we go into the story here and talk about it. Uh, Judah Levin, head of research at Fredo, said the rate increases came alongside reports of full vessels and even containers being rolled to later sailings. Quote, taken together, these developers likely reflect the beginning of a peak season increase in demand. But while blank sailings, blank sailings are sailings where you schedule to sail a vessel, but you don't, you cancel it. It's like, an, you know, you book yourself on an airplane, but they cancel the flight. And now you're going to get yourself on a later flight. Usually decrease during peak season. Reports of increases in capacity reductions suggest that carriers are nonetheless facing an oversupplied market and need to reduce capacity in order to realize volume increase in the form of higher uh, uh, spot rates. And what this all talks about, and it goes on throughout the story, and I go back here to the beginning, is strict capacity discipline. The 
shipping lines and particularly the the ones in the three big alliances there are three big alliances the top nine companies that control about 83 percent of the container capacity they are basically restricting trade they're they're holding back on capacity and tonnage they're also starting to scrap vessels like crazy now and which means is they are being much smarter they are artificially inflating the rates by reducing the number of sailings they're trying to sail ships at full capacity which also means they're slowing down and that is an important factor to be thinking about. If you're going to try to get some freight booked quickly across the Pacific or uh, across the Indian Ocean to Europe, to the East Coast, to the Gulf Coast, have that in mind because you may see a delay in how long it's taking. Because, again, we're waiting. it appears now that the shipping companies are stocking their vessels up and filling them up. At the same time, you see this. Whereas we've seen a slump in the number of containers coming over in terms of row rows, row rows, uh, car carriers are booming right now. Georgia's just set a port record uh, for roll on, roll off. This is in the midst of a lot of issues we see with roll on, roll off carriers. Again, we just talked about the fire on board the um, um, the Fremantle Highway. We had, of course, the deadly fire up in New Jersey on the Grand Casa d'Avorio, but now we're seeing a lot of car carriers out there and that move, that trade is peaking. And then one other thing in the back of your mind to be thinking about here is that the Panama Canal just restricted the number of daily vessel transits. Starting from July 30th of 2023, the daily transit capacity of the canal has been adjusted to an average of 32 uh, ocean faring vessels per day with 10 vessels in the Neo Panamax lanes and 22 in the Panamax lanes, you're usually looking at about 36 to 40 vessels going through the Panama Canal. And now this reduction is going to uh, cut it down. And that means that we're going to see an average daily transits go down. Uh, we see that uh, the two most recent months, May and June, saw an average of only 32.5 and 32.1 transits per day, again, down from that almost 40 vessels per day. And all of that is a factor for you thinking about booking cargo and more importantly for the freight rates. As freight rates increase, that means transportation is going to increase. That means the bottom end is going to increase. And the container liners are doing a smarter move to allocate their resources. They're not getting into the, the fighting war. They saw what happened with freight rates bottoming out here recently. And it seems as if, not that they're coordinating or anything, not like they're in the cartel or anything like that, but it does seem like they're readjusting the way they do their transportation, which is going to impact your ability to get goods onto the shelves and into your hands. All right, let's go ahead and jump over to story number three. So earlier this month in July, there was a fire on board a Mexico uh, Pemex offshore oil platform. It actually killed two people. We have not covered it on this channel, largely because there's so much other stuff going on, and I kept meaning to get back to it. But a story out from Reuters is really talking about the issue right now that the chief executive officer of the Mexican state energy oil sought to downplay an oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico this month, saying it was quickly fixed and less serious than believed. This is the Reuters story over on G-Captain. Uh, Pemex has been under intense pressure from non-governmental organizations and researchers from the country's top university to explain an oil spill recently detected through satellite images. Uh, the CEO, Octavio Romero, said, I never said there wasn't, wasn't a leak. Well, obviously there was. The first detected leaks were on July 3rd, much smaller than reports, and completely fixed by July 10th, according to them. Going on here, having analyzed the direction of ocean currents, Gabriel Gomez, one of the uh, National Autonomous University of Mexico academics, said in a statement that the slick will probably head east-northeast, eventually reach the Gulf Coast in Veracruz or Tampolis states or the United States. Researchers say uh, calculated the path of oil was some 467 square kilometers, 180 square miles in size, about equivalent to 140 soccer fields. This... Uh, Fire was pretty huge. I mean, if you start talking about it, nowhere near the size of like a Deepwater Horizon. This is a fixed oil platform. But this is, again, a chain of things we've been seeing happening down in Mexico. A few years ago, we had an underwater rupture take place, which vented gas and caught fire, what was known as a fire eye. Uh, amazing image. I did a whole video on that that you can go see. But this impact, especially with Mexico, is really important because again this goes into infrastructure and maintaining infrastructure the, the huge oil platforms offshore of mexico 
require a lot of infrastructure, a lot of money, and it doesn't seem as if Pembex is putting in that infrastructure. We are seeing continually issues arise in this. And again, it goes back to how we pay for our energy. And Mexico has, is a huge energy exporter. Let's be clear about it. We tend to think Mexico is not a big economy. They are. They're one of the top 15 economies on the planet. And energy production is one of the key. We import, matter of fact, a lot of fuel from Mexico. Mexico and Canada are our largest importers of energy. So what happens south of the border is really important here. And the fact that two people died in this explosion, it took a concentrated effort by Mexico to get this fire extinguished. And then to deal with a oil spill is important, especially when it starts polluting the Gulf of Mexico and can wash up on the shores of the United States. All right, let's go ahead and jump to story number four. So one of the things I've been started doing, started last week with last week's What the Ship, is taking requests from my Patreon subscribers on stories they would like me to do. This week's story comes from John H. John asked this, what about the newly designated wind farm areas in the Gulf of Mexico that overlap the designated lightering areas? What could possibly go wrong? I will email material if you like. Well, John, let me talk a little bit about wind farms. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about Gulf of Mexico, but I want to talk about wind farms in general. And if you are a Patreon subscriber, hey, send me a note. Let me know a story you would like me to see featured on What the Ship. Just go on to this week's episode, leave a comment, leave a note, and I'll be sure to include it. So a couple of stories hit this week on wind farms. And, you know, wind farms are obviously very controversial for the whole green energy aspect. Now, a lot of what this does is puts uh, energy offshore. You create these huge, massive turbine fans. You obviously have to lay a lot of infrastructure on the ocean floor to bring that power back to shore. The Biden administration has put a huge proposal to see the development of wind farms. This story over in G Captain, the Bloomberg story, Maine lawmakers approved bill to boost offshore wind development. You see this story here, Orsted finalizes lease to become New Jersey offshore wind port's first tenant. And every week in G Captain, particularly I follow, you'll see stories about wind farm development <clears throat> and all the issues associated with it. But John had me thinking about it, and this is the story I really want to focus on because I think it's a really important one. The big thing on wind farms right now off the coast of the United States has to do with the Jones Act and the protected cabotage of the U.S. trade. So we're seeing ship construction down in the Gulf of Mexico right now for new wind vessels that will operate in this. There's a big pushback because of what happened on offshore oil, where most of the offshore oil, offshore oil platforms and industry was basically farmed out overseas. And so you had platforms like Deepwater Horizon, which was a Marshall Island flag vessel. But here you see a real big push to get U.S. flags with U.S. mariners working on them. There's a whole series of organizations that are advocating from that. But this story really highlights, I think, one of the big issues in that there is a shortage worldwide of platforms and mariners that can do this. So this story here by Bloomberg. Offshore wind projects are facing an economic crisis that erased billions of U.S. dollars in planned spending this week just as the world needs clean energy more than ever. A unit of Spain's Iberdola SA agreed to cancel a contract to sell power from a planned wind farm off the coast of Massachusetts. Danish developer Orsted lost a bid to provide offshore wind power to Rhode Island, whose main utility said rising costs made the proposal too expensive. Swedish state-owned utility Vanderfall scuttled plans for a wind farm off the coast of Britain, citing inflation. Soaring co costs, costs, sorry, my New York accent comes out every now and then, are derailing offshore wind projects, even as demand for renewable energy soars. Extreme heat driven by climate change is straining electrical grids all over the world, underscoring the need for power generation and adding urgency to the call for faster transition. Goes on here, energy coming from these projects is desperately needed. Helen Bistrom, the head of Vodafone Falls Wind Business, said on an earning calls this week. Together, the three affected projects would have provided 3.5 gigawatts, gigawatts, again, every time I hear gigawatts, I think of Back to the Future, of power, more than 11% of the total offshore wind fleet currently deployed in the waters of the U.S. and Europe. And the numbers could soon expand. At least 9.7 gigawatts of U.S. Proje projects are at risk because the developers want to renegotiate or exit contracts to sell power at prices that they say are now too low to make investments. 
The jettison projects are the latest sign of stress for offshore wind farms that use turbines larger than skyscrapers to harvest power from the sea air, where winds are more powerful and consistent. Soaring material costs, particularly for steel, force turbines, mark makers to raise prices. Costs of other key services like specialized vessels to install the turbines have jumped sharply as well. And rising interest rates mean that it's more expensive to take on debt. So worldwide, what we're seeing here is that companies are bailing out of previous contracts on wind farms because the costs are escalating. It's getting too expensive to do it. Now, President Biden has put forward a project to do 30 gigawatts of offshore wind instill, instilled in the U.S. by the end of the decade. Uh, but that is a big project. And one of the reasons why you see a big push for U.S. flag vessels to do this is because that would commit them to the U.S trade that would put them on the coast of the United States to do this trade. When it's open to foreign vessels, the foreign vessels are going to go where the money is. And, and again, if they are, if the U.S. gets outbid, they're going to pull those vessels off and go to other areas. This is actually an inflection moment for the United States. There's a lot of potential for the U.S. to build vessels to deal with this trade. Are U.S. vessels going to be more expensive than foreign built vessels? Yes. It's going to be the case. Why is that? Because those those countries subsidize them like like ridiculous. Japan, China, Korea subsidize like crazy. So do the Europeans. They all do it. We need to improve the investment in U.S. ship construction right now so that we can get vessels being built. We already see it being done down in Houma, Louisiana, with a vessel being built for by Shoest down there. We need to do that so that if wind power is going to be a alternative and a supplement to existing. I Listen, I, I for one don't buy the idea that wind power will be the end all be all. It's not. You need a, a, a mixture of power sources, but it's windy on the ocean. I can tell you that it is wind. There's power out there to be grabbed. We should be investing in that. And what this story talks about here is really that important. What we saw happen in offshore oil and drilling is that that was farmed out to a lot of other companies. And when all of a sudden uh, the market dried out or slowed down in the United States for offshore oil, those boats, those crews, they left. And now they're in the Far East, they're in Asia, they're in Africa, they're in the Indian Ocean, they're off the coast of South America, exploring those areas. And we can't get them back here unless we pay a huge amount of money to bring them back. And so when you invest in an infrastructure in the United States, then you can have it kind of prioritized to, to handle the United States. We're a huge power. We need power. We're a massive energy consumer. There's no doubt that we're going to need power in the United States. And this is a moment where you see it. Plus, you can really start investing in some alternative power sources for these vessels. Since they're operating in the coastal trade, it would be really efficient. There was a story just this week that China has built a feeder container vessel that's battery powered. They actually use containers of batteries to fuel it, but it's a very small vessel. It's it's not like one of the huge, massive, intercontinental, uh, uh, ultra-large container vessels. It's used in the coastal trade. Well, you can do that in the United States for a lot of these vessels. You can come up with hybrid power to be used. We need to think in a new manner. All right, let's go to our last story. Our last story comes from Sam Chambers over at Splash 24-7. Liberia has replaced Panama as the world's largest flag. No, they don't, do not have a huge, massive flag that uh, you know people are doing to overcompensate for other areas. No, that's, that's not what we're talking about. Anybody ever does that. What we're talking about here is that the Liberian registry now has more vessels than any other registry, including Panama. For the first time in 30 years, Panama is no longer the world's largest registry. Revel Liberia has overhauled the Central American nation in terms of gross tonnage and new data issued by Clarkson Research. The Liberian flag now has 2.2 million gross tons led over Panama at the top of the registry's rankings, its fleet growing by 5.6% as of this year. In terms of number of ships on the book, Panama retains a healthy lead by more than 3,200 ships. Liberia makes it up for that by having large tankers and bulkers. That tends to be what is attracted to the Liberian flag. Looking at the list of the top 30 flags, the big losers this year have been Malta and Cyprus, likely as a result of Russia's war in Ukraine. While the flag that has grown the most in percentage terms comes by some distances has been Germany, a nation that is showing signs of having finally thrown off the maritime shackles that has dogged it for more than a decade. If you look at this chart, 
It shows you the top flags by percentage in gross tons with Liberia just edging out uh, Panama. Then in third place comes the Marshall Islands. Interesting to note, if you look at number four and number six, it's Hong Kong and China. Add them up, they are just behind Panama on this list. China is growing along if you add Hong Kong into it. And then in the distance, you have Singapore, Malta, Bahamas, Greece, and then Japan. Really interesting to see where they fall out. If you look at the United States on this list, number 21 in the world. Interesting to note, Liberia's headquarters is pretty far, actually, from uh, the headquarters of Panama, but not as far as you might think. Yes, Liberia is, is located in West Africa, Panama right there in Central America, but Liberia is actually very close to the Marshall Islands, <laughs> not geographically, not, not in distance, Marshall Islands in the middle of the Pacific, but the headquarters of both Liberia and the Marshall Islands Registry is, is not in Liberia, it's not in Monrovia, it's, it's not in the Marshall Islands. It's actually in Virginia, just outside of Dulles Airport, within a, a very short Uber distance of each other, matter of fact. You can drive to the largest registry in the world, Liberia, hop an Uber, and then be in the Marshall Islands within minutes. It's amazing because these are open registries. These are registries that were created, the Liberian registry uh, at the end of World War II to give Liberia an income, but it was headquartered in the United States and then the Marshall Islands as an alternative to Liberia and Panama when things were going badly in Liberia and Panama during the 1970s and 80s. It was seen as an alternative. They're, they are pure open registries. Uh, they're also a lot less strict in oversight. We've seen how long it takes, for example, for the Panama Maritime Authority to issue reports on accidents. It took two years to get the Ever Given report. It took three years to get the report about the Wakashio. No telling how long it'll be to get the report on the Fremantle Highway, which is burning off the coast of uh, the Netherlands right now. These are registries. These are also registries that have been very instrumental in the transportation of sanctioned oil around the world. We see a lot of the dark fleet, the, the fleet that's been moving Russian oil, go to these registries uh, because, again, it's, it's open for them to do it without a lot of oversight. Five stories. We span the distance here. We covered quite a lot. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. If you did, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, share it across social media, give it a thumbs up, and if you can, support the page. How do you do that? Well, you can hit the super thanks button down below and contribute directly to the page or head on over to Patreon, become a monthly, yearly subscriber. You can also, in the show notes for, or excuse me, in the comments for this video over at Patreon, submit your request for for next week's story, I'm going to be sure to hit always a story that my Patreon members are asking for. Be sure to keep an eye out. We'll be having a feature act come out on car carriers and ship fires, along with several other videos over this week. Until our next video, this is Sal signing off.